Good evening. Welcome to Savvy Contemporary. It's a pleasure to open this first day of invocations. And um, I was told by the curators of the exhibition, Ashra Kara and Sagal Farah, to say a word. And I am happy to do so. And instead of using my words, I would like to use the words of um, Arya Eber, who is uh, an Afghani German poet um, whose fascinating work I've been following in the past years. And I would like to read a few lines from a poem of hers as um, a point of departure for these two days of thinking about waiting. And uh, so just permit me to do that. So these are her words. It's from this beautiful collection, so you should get it, called Heart Damage. And uh, the poem I chose to read is titled Kronos, for obvious reasons. <clears throat> it is a terrible time to be alive. I say this with the privilege of being alive. I say this with the privilege of an oak tree in the park preserved by construction tape. It's nescience concerning the red cost of being alive. I say this with the privilege of painting this page, copper beyond meaning. I say this with my father's face in mind, his eyes a glade of sand pines, with seven mules and tanks, rifle in hand. I say this with a body not at war. It is a privilege to say land without thinking mine. It is a privilege to think the old time seems weak and wanting. Imagine flesh panting, the curse so wide and narrowing. The new time I keep in my pocket, trace its borders, slide my finger into its hole, and its wet opening does not speak to me, and my body is a coin flipping. And it is a terrible time to be alive. I land on my thousand faces with my handful of privileges. Still, the pavement is gentle to my mouth, my wet openings. I was also asked to say a few words about Savi, which I will not really do, but say that uh, Savi came into being because of the fact that we couldn't wait anymore. We couldn't wait to have our voices heard. We couldn't wait any longer to have our positions perceived, listened to, acknowledged. We had to create a space called Savvy Contemporary. And from the very onset, I think the only constant that Savi has been waiting, waiting for finances, waiting for people to understand what we're doing, waiting to be able to find the right words, the right art, the right people for the kind of epistemic frames we wanted to share. Waiting to be in communion, to be together. So waiting has been a constant. So it's just logical that we get to a point where Hashra proposed the project on waiting. We keep on waiting. Waiting for each of you to become a part of Savvy. Waiting for each of you to become a member to support the institution, waiting to see how things become, 
as a space that is constantly in the becoming, we need to see how the political win, the sociopolitical win, wins change with time. We're constantly waiting. But waiting is not a passive project. It's an active one. Because we wish, we intend to shape those winds. And that is why we exist. Waiting as existence. Thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Hashra, to Sagal. Thank you so much, Bona. Um, yeah, I think um, it feels a bit appropriate to start uh, with some gratitude to um, the opportunity, the space, the guidance to think, to plan, to uh, come together, uh, to learn together, and to grow together. And for this, I would. Uh, really like to, uh, of course, Savvy being the space that it has been in the becoming, uh, which has given so many of us that um, space to think together and come together. Um, I would like to uh, really uh, thank the artistic director, Bonaventure, for his guidance in this uh, Uh, in this journey, uh, the entire team, the artists, and all the participants that we have for the two days with us. And uh, not least, uh, all of you, dear friends, uh, a very, very warm welcome to Savi. Um, it's always heartening to see you all making time uh, to participate and engage in our collective quest for learning and thinking. Uh, a little bit about this uh, project, how will you a certain time? Um, uh, some of it Bona has already uh, contextualized, uh, is to think of time through the lens of waiting. Uh, it is uh, an ongoing predicament that, is, uh, that holds a different nature and intensity for each body. Um, and here we attempt to move beyond the hegemonic idea of universal time, which is a capital and colonial construct. Um, whether we see the politics that surround us, that is also very much a part of our lives as well. Um, and whether we, so it is at a personal level and at a collective level and all that surrounds us. Um, as we delve into this non-linear affective realm of waiting through research, we initiated the dialogue through 14 artistic positions that were part uh, of this exhibition that is now coming to an end. This was the, uh, the, the first step in this direction. And now it, uh, these approaches are further challenged and complicate, complicate our understandings throughout these two days of scholarly thought, uh, poetry, and music. I'll read out uh, a small excerpt uh, from uh, what I had written uh, for this project. To a new unknown, a vast expanse uncontainable, unquantifiable, an anticipated new unknown, where the proximity is such that it lacks the horizon. 
Regardless of which path leads you, leads you to this realm, it is a space in between, the extent, intensity, and nature of which is ungraspable in words. To be read, if possible, in the distance between each letter, word, and line, where the distance is undeterminable. It is like a sentence starting from the middle where the indicators of intent, purpose, and duration are missing. It is the time where the body becomes a permeable vessel, which embodies multiple temporalities of the past, present, and future, and multiple geographies. One that is the physical present, the other that is the place of origin, and then ones that are desired and aspired for, that are perhaps more imagined than real, passing through the body simultaneously where it exists in all, yet is not anchored in any. So the question was, how is this static realm navigated where the notions of forward and backward collapse and no timeline exists? Mehmood Darvish proposes, remember so that you grow before disillusion. Perhaps this remembrance is a call to reach within and recognize and acknowledge the fabric of being that is one with the elements forming the materiality of the vessel that is the body and the soul, the same way the wind, water, fire, earth, and space embody it and where the path is paved through inherited knowledges that crown this vessel and leads the path perhaps towards other dimensions. This research project aims to acknowledge, reflect, address, engage, and share the experience and negotiation of time and space in the realm of dating and a recognition of the pol political and social infrastructures that are complicit in its existence and in prolonging it. It is an attempt to expand the narrative to its multi-dimensional experience and understanding where waiting or suspended time denotes a process of transition, reconfiguration, regeneration, and reimagination. And it is very important at this point to mention that these processes are embedded in loss, grief, separation, and in some instances, the realm between life and death, as one of our artists, Dakota Guo, has, turned, has coined it, the realm of undead. And here we think of victims of armed conflicts and forced disappearances. The 14 positions that have manifested in this first iteration of our research think through this realm as a space where histories, languages, entities, and spiritualities dimensions and temporalities coalesce. Um, it's a, uh, a year-long uh, project, and I would like to also mention Hauptstadt Kultur Funds that have funded this project. Um, we, start, we have started with research. The first physical manifestation of it was uh, the 14 um, uh, artistic positions that have taken um, this started, initiated this dialogue, and now we are expanding it through these two days. And uh, following this is going to be um, workshops that we have coined as positions, moments of reflection, uh, which are going to pan out throughout the year. And in the end, I would like to keep it short so we could uh, start with our program, uh, but also, once again, um, gratitude to the wonderful team that has made it possible, uh, and to all the artists who have not just believed in this uh, vision, but have also participated, and really uh, also the participants who have come together and joined us in this journey. Um, so here is a, an ode to the public's in waiting. And uh, I will now pass on to my, the co-curator, Sagal Para.
one. How about now? Okay, wonderful. So, first of all, I want to say a warm thank you to um, our artistic director, Bonaventure, who guided us in this, uh, in this project. And also to Hadra, of course, who brought this, um, this topic to the table. And it was one that fell naturally into place, I find within Savi's discourse. So, and thank you to all of you who are here today. Thank you for joining us. I dare say, I dare say that we all have waited for something or someone sometime, whether it be in anticipation or in suspense. Waiting for holidays when young, all the days of Ramadan, the four weeks of Advent, waiting for a child to arrive, or for comic relief, or for something that might never come. In Beyond the Periphery of the Skin, Silvia Federici writes that fixation in space and time has been one of the most elementary and persistent techniques capitalism has used to take hold of the body. And we can look at attacks throughout history on vagabonds and migrants, mobility as a threat when not pursued for the sake of work, as it circulates knowledge, experiences, and struggles. In the past, the instruments of restraints were whips, chains, the stocks, mutilation, and enslavement. And these days, we can look at detention centers. I'd like to share a bit of an anecdote with you. Um, a dear friend once told me that, he told me about a night that he spent in the Negev desert, in a desert cabin where he felt that the silence was so invasive that he could only hear two things. One was the sound of a clock on the wall, and the other was the sound of his beating heart. And both of them were measuring the passing of time. He also mentioned that when the humidity was high enough, he could hear the sound of passing trains, ones that he'd actually used to travel to this point himself. But when the air was dry, the silence brought on by the environment made him forget the ways that led him there and the ones that could take him home. So on the note of silence and the heartbeat, Please allow me to share a poem with you by Wyslava Symborska. It's called Could Have. It could have happened, it had to happen. It happened earlier, later, nearer, farther off. It happened, but not to you. You were saved because you were the first. You were saved because you were the last, alone, with others, on the right, the left, because it was raining, <clears throat> because of the shade, because the day was sunny. You were in luck, there was a forest. You were in luck, there were no trees. You were in luck, a rake, a hook, a beam, a break, a jam, a turn, a quarter inch, an instant. You were in luck, just then a straw went floating by. As a result, because, although, despite. What would have happened if a hand, a foot, within an inch, a hair's breadth from an unfortunate coincidence? So you're here, still dizzy from another dodge, close shave, reprieve. One hole in the net and you slip through. I couldn't be more shocked or speechless. Listen how your heart pounds inside me. Now, on that note, again, thank you. And on that note, again, please allow me to introduce our first guest, uh, Jasmine Gufon, in collaboration with Stephen Bokaye. 
Silence is the loudest sound you can ever hear, is a sound piece. Stephen Boakir, an international student at Kiev Medical University, generously shares his recent journey from Kiev to Berlin from listening perspectives. A journey at once in motion and waiting is told through sonic encounters. Sound as a medium that unfolds over the time never truly disappears, but continues to reverberate beyond human oral perception. The figure of sound provides a metaphor for the varying repetitions, feedback, loopings, and endless experiences of waiting that resonate, that resonate both personally and systematically. Jasmine Gaffon is an artist, composer, artist and composer, working at the interface of social, political, and technical infrastructures. Focused on electronic compositions across music and art contexts, her practice spans live performances, recording, installation, and custom-made browser add-on. Through the sonification of data, she addresses the potential of sound to engage with contemporary political questions and engages listening as a situated knowledge practice. Thank you. From Lviv to Oshgorod, what was happening? The sounds of explosions, loud explosions woke me up in cave, and uh, I didn't know what was happening. All I heard was sounds of explosions and uh, sounds of uh, car sirens, uh, alarms from vehicles because there were vibrations also. So I waited in my room hearing the sounds of explosions until it was morning and I immediately got to the train station to get a ticket. There were thousands of people already queued trying to get tickets. And there we heard sounds of sirens. And uh, the sirens, the meaning of those sirens, uh, are if you heard them, run to a place of safety, either in a basement or the subway. And hearing these voices of frustrations, anger, upset, sorrows, and people were crying. I didn't get a ticket, so I had to return back home. And upon returning home, there were still the sounds of sirens. Uh, throughout the day, you hear uh, footsteps and the uh, sounds of people running and people shouting. Because the moment the siren uh, comes up, people are calling their family members to run to a place of safety. So from there, I joined some people to travel to Lviv hoping that we will cross the Polish border in their car. And uh, on our way out from Kiev, also we experienced loud explosions and it was really close. It was really close and uh, there were sirens again. And we met this Ukrainian Ammo car. I had never seen one move. And it had this sound of uh, like it has, I think it has a big engine. So there is this sound of woo and uh, I, do you know what I mean? The Ambo car. Uh, yes. Like a tank. Uh, it was passing beside us, going to uh, the place they think the attack is coming from. So it was a sound that I, had, I have never heard before because I have never seen a tank move. And so there, while in the queue, all that you can hear are the sounds of engines, car engines, and uh, people also discussing uh, where they are going and uh, people speaking out of frustration. And uh, you will hear the sounds of the doors of cars being shut. Yeah, and uh, cracks of car doors because people were going in and out of their cars. And there in Lviv, the city center also, we heard a series of sirens, but uh, no threat of explosions. The sirens were on, but no threat of uh, explosions. And uh, due to the traffic, 
we diverted our way to uh, hoping to cross the Hungarian border. So there, also from Lviv to Oshgorod, there were traffics, and we got to a place where the roads are all curves. So we had to spend the night in traffic. And during the night, and this is a, it's a really calm place. You hear nothing. All that you can hear is the sound of wind passing by. Because it was a really cool place. More like a jungle. Yeah, so we spent the night there. And it was snowing also. So the, these two sounds were really loud for you to hear. The sound of wind and the snow dropping on the cars. So from there we got to the Hungarian border. And there also there was traffic of which we had to be in the queue. And there we experienced a series of frustration noises. Yeah, because people were wailing because they've lost everything. Most of them were Ukrainians. They were leaving their country to a place they never thought of going. So they knew not what would happen there. So they were crying, wailing. And we heard that some people also lost, lost their minds due to the load of psychological effects that uh, they experienced. I had to get out from the car to uh, find my, uh, myself a different route to cross the border. So upon getting out, I heard my luggage, the noise from my luggage and others also because they were pulling their luggages. Some were pulling to the border and some were pulling their luggages from the border back to the city because they were being sent back. So with their luggages and bags, they have, they have to pull them all back. And these were also the sounds that I heard whilst I was waiting, trying to figure out a way to cross the border. So upon crossing the border, uh, I got to Slovakia. And it was after 12 midnight. Uh, they dropped me at the first guest house that they saw which was, I think, on the bank of entering the city. So it was really, really silent in that neighborhood. Not many houses. And it was dark. The lights that you see are the lights in the few houses around. And I put my luggage into this guest house and right in front of the door to the reception, was written full. Like, like the rooms are all filled up, yes. And the door was locked. I knocked and knocked and knocked and no one opened. And I didn't know where to go. So I had to sit on a long table and a, and a bench that was in front of the door. There was no noise, even you could hear if a pin falls, it was really silent. And there I realized that silence is the loudest sound you can ever hear to me. Because there I was reflecting why people cannot contain silence. Because um, people feel, uh, it's difficult for people to be alone by themselves because they cannot contain them loudness of silence. They have to get themselves doing something. Yes, and I experienced such a thing there because I was there alone uh, at midnight and there was nothing that you could hear, only silence. And there, I'm religious, I'm a Christian, so I believe God leads me and he teaches me. So there, I started to meditate on the scriptures and on God and uh, I started to pray and I felt okay and within me I felt loved by God. So 
I believe that he was even loving me and speaking to me inwardly, of which it encouraged me that it will be well. So I sat there for over 30 minutes to an hour, and it began to snow. And it began to also be windy over there. And the wind was heading towards my direction. So I heard the sound like shh, shh, because it was so silent in the neighborhood. You could hear the moving of the wind. So in the morning, uh, I was woke up by the singing of the birds because there were some trees in the compound of the guest house and the birds were singing. So when I got to Warsaw, the sounds that I heard at the train station was obviously the sounds of trains and also the sounds of Ukrainians. Most of them were stranded. Not only Ukrainians, also uh, like international students also. In Warsaw, I heard the sirens of police cars. Yeah, I didn't know why, but maybe it was due to the uh, many people and they wanted to control the majority of people that they have received, uh, knowing, not knowing what to do and where to go. So I went to this place and uh, I met the host and they took me to their home. And I heard, the moment I got there, the first sound that I heard was the box of dogs. Because they had one dog and the, their neighbor also had a dog. And they were all barking because they have seen a new person. And there I had to wait at their place for a month and a few days. And their place was uh, a bit outside of Warsaw. Warsaw is really noisy because there are many people going in and out each day. But outside, Warsaw is very calm. So there you can hear a lot of things of which I heard the explosions also. But not this time, not an attack. But it was training of the NATO soldiers uh, who were being trained to respond if there is any attack near Polish border. So you you hear the explosions of their trainings and you hear the sounds of helicopter also going back and forth to the Polish border and back to the city also. And I heard those things. And uh, in the town, in the going around the city, uh, the city also, the place where we live, I went to a park one day and I heard these sounds of ducks because there were ponds at this park it was really beautiful the park is really calm and so if the ducks swimming makes noise you hear them and also I had the opportunity to experience a squirrel come so close to human to get a treat yes and no they also make some very little sounds when eating because people give them nuts. So I had the opportunity to see them also. It was really difficult to focus what you, you hear around because of the situation I was in. But then these were some of the sounds that I heard. So there the people were really good to me, the family. They tried to help me in the best way they could. But then being a third country nationalist, it was really difficult. And I had to renew my passport. So I told them that I have to move on to get my passport renewed before it expires. And so if you are applying for a visa, they want you to have a valid uh, passport, not less than six months. So I wanted to meet that requirement. And they understood and helped me with everything and prepared me to be on my journey. So from there, I went to Austria. And in Austria, I first got to Lens. 
And there, by God's grace, some people hosted me. And there also, they tried to help me. And that was the place that I thought of renewing my passport. But a um, few days that I spent there, like a, a two days, it wasn't a good experience, so I had to leave. Because the, links, the, the day that I got there, the, my host took me to the police station to get me registered. But they didn't, they refused, they directed us to another place. So from Linz, we went to Vienna. And from Vienna, we went to a, a city called Monse. And from Monse, we went to Salzburg. Monse, it is a, it's far from cities in a, like a valley. So you see hills. Yeah, and there are also like manufacturing, so you hear sounds of things being manufactured. Yes, and uh, you hear people making, like they are working, molding things. So these were the sounds, like industrial sounds that I heard from that month. Say. So I went to Salzburg with the host, and there the guy told us the truth that the Austrians are not receiving dead country nationalists so they will tell me to go here and there here and there until I give up then I will move away from Austria and I said okay so there wasn't any point staying there so I had to move on and uh, these people who have been helping me from Poland who gave me the host in uh, in Poland they were, they were still, I was in touch with them always and they were always leading me. So they also contacted some people here in Germany when I was my, on my way from uh, Austria to Germany. And uh, from the train station here, the sounds that you hear are the same old sounds. Sounds of frustration, sounds of trains, people crying also because there were few people who are not Ukrainians, not third country nationalists on board. We all were people from Ukraine. So every voice that you hear are voices of either anger, frustrations, or sorrows. Only arriving in Poland, the Polish people I heard laughing. And in Austria, because they they were living their normal lives. But we, from where we are coming from and what we have experienced, there is nothing like laughter. So those were most of the things I experienced and the sounds I heard. And uh, upon getting to Germany, by God's grace, I met Pats. And there, it was okay for me because I... I felt she encouraged me, so I felt really comforted. Um, so next is um, a sonic intervention from Tumi Mogorosi and Gabi Motuba. Um, Tumi Mogorosi is an artist, activist, and theorist 
with a focus on the black liberation through the prism of the black radical tradition, also as a way to engage the black sonic in its diasporic articulation. His practice straddles across performance theory, jazz studies, Afro-pessimism, critical theory, and black studies in close relation with the question on black liberation beyond the incompleteness of the South African rainbowism and global emancipation politics. He is a South African Music Award nominee, Standard Bank Ovation Award recipient, Male and Guardian Jazz Album of the Year. The acclaimed South African has ref refined his breaststrokes alongside prominent South African jazz musicians, among them trumpeter Fea Faku, saxophonist Zim Nakawana, um, bassist Herbie Tso Toili, as well as pianist Andili Yanana, to name a few. Um, Tumi holds an MAFA from the University of Witwatersrand, and he is currently in enrolled in the Political Studies PhD program with a focus on Afro-pessimism and cultural work. Gabi Motuba is an award-winning South African jazz vocalist and composer. She studied at, excuse me, um, Chwane University of Technology, um, where she majored in jazz studies. In 2015, Gabi was commissioned to co-compose music for vocals, cello, piano, and drums during the Swiss Artist Residency Program. The compositions became part of her debut duo album, Sanctum Sanctorium, featuring Swiss pianist Malcolm Braff. In 2017, Gabi composed 10 string quartet compositions. These compositions form part of her debut solo album, Tefiti Goddess of Creation, which was nominated for a 2019 South African Music Award for Best Alternative Album. Gabi has been selected as part of the 2022 cohort of the Mutual Mentorship for Musicians program, which is a platform created to empower female musicians all over the world through a radical model of mentorship and musical collaborative commissions. Gabi is currently a resident in residency at the Soweto Theater as a music facilitator and educator. Um, so throughout the program between today and tomorrow will be four sonic interventions. Um, and so this first one um, next is on desert wind as the backdrop opens up a way, open up ways the desert is used to invoke the violences of slave roots in the interior of Africa. Coupled with the drum and a multi-layered voice, a space opens up to think the void of the desert and the cry from afar.
Wow, uh, that was quite, quite breathtaking. Um, it's just really unfortunate. Uh, to me and Gabi were supposed to join us in person, uh, but they did not get their visas. Um, we'll get to hear more of them uh, in these two days. Um, but for now, uh, we'll take a very short 10 minute break for you to get drinks or just straighten your legs, have a cigarette break. And uh, then we'll join again uh, for our next in-person session.
Is it on? Yeah. <laughs> hey, everyone, we're coming back. So if you'd like to take your places again, this is all about waiting, so just a bit more. So the next presentation will be from Angelica. So Angelica Freitas. Uh, she's a writer from Brazil and the author of three books of poetry and a graphic novel. Her poems have appeared in publications such as Granta, Poetry, and Modern Poetry in Translation. Some recurring themes in her work are women and question of belonging or not to a place. Freitas come to Berlin with the DAD artist program in July 2020 and has been living here ever since. Just before we go through for the presentation of um, Angelica, I would like to just have a, a few words that uh, her work made me think of um, while thinking about the, de the, the depth and also the path that the words weight means also in Portuguese two different things. So uh, myself being Portuguese, I could not avoid to think about that. So to wait in Portuguese gives the root for the words to wait in Portuguese, which means esperar, or to wait as in to hope in Portuguese, esperança. The root is the same in Portuguese. So. While thinking about this, I could not avoid thinking about something that Paulo Freire, a philosopher, Brazilian philosopher, wrote um, in uh, his book, Pedagogy of Hope, in 1992, a reflection on his previous book, actually, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, published in 1968, during his exile in Chile. While thinking on depths and the different paths of the word wait, esperar, that uh, Angelic will also think and share with us, it uh, then, um, it, 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 it makes me think of a, a specific poem I'm, I'm now gonna read, first in Portuguese, then in English. So for those who understand Portuguese, I think it will make a bit more sense due to the root of the word. I'll read it out now. É preciso ter esperança, mas ter esperança do verbo esperançar, porque tem gente que tem esperança do verbo esperar. E esperança do verbo esperar não é esperança, é espera. Esperançar é se levantar, esperançar é ir atrás, esperançar é construir, esperançar é não desistir, esperançar é levar adiante, esperançar é juntar-se com outros para fazer de outro modo. Now in English. It is necessary to have hope, but to have hope from the verb to hope because there are people who have hope of the verb to wait. And hope of the verb to wait is not hope, it is waiting. To hope is, not, is to get up. To hope is to go after. To hope is to build. To hope is to not give up. To hope is to carry on. To hope is to join with others and do otherwise. Angelica. <laughs> Thank you, Antonio. Um, we share the same language and uh, the same meanings. Thank you. And thank you, Savi, and your lovely team for the invitation.
In Portuguese, the verb esperar has multiple meanings. Primarily, it means to wait, as in espero, I wait. But it also means to hope, as in espero, and to expect, espero. The word esperança, hope, was something we Brazilians always associated with our people. We were, after all, at some point, the country of the future. School history books taught us that it was a Portuguese explorer who first rounded the Cape of Good Hope in 1488. He called it Cape of Storms, but the King of Portugal was elated with the news and renamed it Cabo da Boa Esperança. My mother, when she turned 50, started to say, I am now past the Cape of Good Hope. Espero, 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 espero. Espero, 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 espero. Your hopes, crumpled, are a sheet of paper. Your heart, pounding, is a stamp on a formula. Truly, I don't see much of a future in searching for metaphors at the Auslander Behörde. Mãos, queixo, glúteos, banco, osso, tábua, isquios, tíbia, 
How I long for the day to dawn for whichever reasons. Pega um número no guichê, vai aparecer no painel. The solitude of my days will end. Tell me all about where you've been, you gorgeous lunatic. Duas vias, 2 a.m. Heavy, heavy eyelids. I can't find your name in our system. In grego significa mensageiro. Can I leave a message? Pode. Põe a culpa na safo. O seu nome não está no sistema. In ancient Greek, it means messenger. Posso deixar um recado? Yes. Of course, it's all Safo's fault. Tau te marmelo. O caminho da fruta era até o chão. A mão aparoa, maceroa em açúcar. Fogo baixo por três horas, pão crescendo na mesa ao lado. Todas as ínfimas partículas gritando geleia, a de onde viemos, onde não havia fome nem alimentação. Tau te quince. The way of the fruit is to the ground. The hand caught it, pureed it in sugar, low heat for three hours, bread rising on the table. All the tiny particles yelling jam, the one we came from, where there was neither hunger nor feeding. Querida Angélica, querida Angélica, não pude ir, fiquei presa no elevador entre o décimo e o nono andar e até que o zelador se desse conta já eram dez e meia. Querida Angélica, não pude ir, tive um pequeno acidente doméstico, meu cabelo se enganchou dentro da lavadora, na verdade está preso até agora, estou ditando este e-mail para minha vizinha. Querida Angélica, não pude ir, meu cachorro morreu e depois ressuscitou e subiu aos céus. Passei a tarde envolvida com os bombeiros e as escadas magiros. Querida Angélica, não pude ir, perdi meu cartão do banco num caixa automático. Fui reclamar para o guarda que, na verdade, era um assaltante, me roubou a bolsa e com um choque tive amnésia. Querida Angélica, não pude ir, meu chefe me ligou na última hora, disse que ia para o Havaí de motocicleta e eu tive que ir para o trabalho de biquíni, portanto me resfriei. 
Querida Angélica, não pude ir. Estou num cybercafé às margens do Orinoco. Fui sequestrada por um grupo terrorista. Por favor, deposite 10 mil dólares na conta 11308, dígito 0, do Citibank, Agência Valparaíso. Obrigada, pago quando voltar. Dear Angelica, Dear Angelica, I can't make it. I got stuck in the elevator between the ninth and 10th floors, and by the time the elevator man realized, it was already 10.30. Dear Angelica, I can't make it. I had a little problem at home. My hair got caught in the washing machine. Actually, it's still stuck now. I'm dictating this email to my neighbor. Dear Angelica, I can't make it. My dog died and was resurrected and ascended to heaven. I spent the whole afternoon involved with firemen and aerial ladder trucks. Dear Angelica, I can't make it. I lost my bank card in an ATM. I went to complain to the security guard who was actually a crook. He stole my purse and I had amnesia from the shock. Dear Angelica, I can't make it. My boss called me at the last minute saying he went to Hawaii on a motorcycle and I had to go to work in a bikini, so I caught a cold. Dear Angelica, I can't make it. I'm in a cyber cafe by the Orinoco. I was kidnapped by a terrorist group. Please deposit $10,000 in account 11308 at Citibank Valparaíso branch. Thanks, I'll pay you back when I get home. Boss. Os homens, as mulheres nascem, crescem, vêm como os outros nascem, como desaparecem, Desse mistério brota um cemitério, enterram carcaças, depois esquecem. Os homens, as mulheres nascem, crescem, vêm como os outros nascem, como desaparecem. Registram, registram com o celular, fazem planilhas, depois esquecem. Torcem para que demore sua vez, os homens, as mulheres não sabem o que vem depois, então fazem uma pós os homens, as mulheres nascem, crescem, sabem que um dia nascem, no outro desaparecem, mas nem por isso se esquecem de apagar o gás e a luz. Grad. Men, women are born, they grow, they see how others are born and how they disappear. From this mystery, a cemetery arises, they bury bodies, then forget. Men, women are born, they grow, they see how others are born and how they disappear. They record, record with their phones, make spreadsheets and then forget. They hope their time comes slowly. Men, women don't know what comes next, so they go to grad school. Men, women are born, they grow, they know that one day they're born and the next they disappear, but that's not why they forget to turn off the lights and the gas. Não adianta chegar na porta e ordenar, abra, öffnen, open. É preciso girar a chave. E mais, é preciso saber qual chave, ou então esbarrar na dureza de certos materiais. Mogno, pinho, cedro ou lâmina de qualquer madeira. Conhecer a chave ou intuir para que lado gira. Tão poucos têm tão pouca paciência. It's no use 
arriving at the door and commanding, open, öffnen, abra. You have to turn the key. Plus, you have to know which key or bump against the hardness of certain materials, mahogany, pine, cedar, or a plank of any wood. To be familiar with the key or else intuit which way to turn it. So many people have so little patience. You're just waiting here to be like us, to talk like us, to live like us. You just gotta wait a little more. You know the score, a little more. How many days? It's not enough. A little more, a little more. Let's just fill out this here form, I mean this form, the A1 form, then you wait and fill another form, the B2 form, the A3 form. We need the form, you print the form, fill out the form, send us the form. You're just waiting here to be like us, to talk like us, to live like us. You just gotta wait a little more. You know the score, a little more. How many days? It's not enough. Just not enough, a little more. Let's just fill out this here form. I mean this form, the A1 form. Then you wait and fill another form, the B2 form, the A3 form. Just send the form, you'll hear from us, to be like us and live like us.
Okay. Um, so if you could all settle down a bit, we'll start. Okay. Thank you so much, Angelica. That was really, really beautiful. Um, making us think about the weight of languages, the texture of languages, um, where it also resounds with the silence and the sounds of the, the haunting sounds of the desert. Um, espero, espero. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce the next session uh, by Maria do Mar Castro Varela. Um, Maria is a professor of general education and social work at the Alice Solomon University of Applied Sciences in Berlin with a focus on gender and queer studies. She holds a double degree in psychology and pedagogy and a PhD in political science. Last semester, she was the Sir Peter Ustinov Visiting Professor at the Institute of Contemporary History at the University of Vienna. Her work focuses on queer studies, post-colonial theory, critical migration, and educational studies, trauma studies, and conspiracy narratives. Amongst others, she was a senior fellow at the Institute for the Science of Men in Vienna, 2015-16, and visiting fellow at the Institute of Humanities and International Law in Melbourne. She's a member of the Radiating Globality Research Group led by Guy Three Spivak, founder and member of Bildungslab, chair of the Berlin Institute for Contrapuntal Social Analysis and principal investigator of the research project Digital Haas. In her latest publication, uh, which came out last year, co-authored with Yenri Beramoglu, she works out a new theory of fragility. Uh, Maria's session today is titled, Hope You Brought Time, Letting People Wait as a Tactic of Power. Uh, should I share a little bit about the uh, a little abstract, or I let you do that? Okay. <laughs> in, her con uh, in her contribution, Maria will present making people wait as a tactic of power. Who has to wait? Who can skip the cues? Whose time is valuable? Who's always assumed to have time? Time is an important resource. Having time is a luxury, but time is also stolen and accumulated. Who is stealing time from whom? In short, time is presented as a valuable commodity that, like air and light, is unequally distributed. Castro Varela therefore pleads for a social redistribution of time and the right to boredom for everyone. I welcome Maria Domar Castro Varela. One second, so the beamer is on, and then I'll start. I prepared a, a little lecture and trying to bring us to think about waiting and about time and the time of waiting as something directly connected to power and also to violence. It is, this is just some fragmented thoughts and some like we like to say um, in research, work in progress. And um, hopefully the PowerPoint starts, then I can accompany my words with some pictures also. We start. The title of my little talk is Hope You Brought Time, Letting People Wait as a Tactic of Power. 
Before I start, I want to express my sincere gratitude for the invitation to the Invocations programs, which I read as a space for thinking about the power of time and the power of distributing time, as well as a possibility to rethink the dynamics of waiting. It is an honor for me to be here. What I will present is nothing more than first thoughts on waiting in post-pandemic times. The materialist feminist philosopher and physicist Karen Barat wrote in 2017, that means exactly two years before a pandemic threw the world into a turmoil, in an article titled Troubling Times and Ecologies of Nothingness, Returning, Remembering and Facing the Incalculable, In these troubling times, the urgency to trouble time, to shake it to its core, and to produce collective imaginaries that undo perversive conceptions of temporality, that take progress as inevitable, and the past as something that has passed and is no longer with us, is something so tangible, so visceral, that it can be felt in our individual and collective bodies. We are living in post-pandemic times, troubling times that have to be troubled, as Barat tells us. These are times felt as in between, and times closer than ever to the abyss, to the catastrophe, to the end of the world. The doomsday clock represents, in the opinion of atomic scientists, the likelihood of a man-made global catastrophe. The clock is actually a metaphor for threats to humanity from unchecked scientific and technologically advances. The main factors influencing the clock are nuclear risk and climate change. The clock actually was set in motion in 1947, the beginning of the Cold War. And at that time, it showed exactly seven minutes to midnight. In 2020, the clock was set on 100 seconds to midnight and has since not been moved. Even the doomsday clock, it seems, stopped ticking during the pandemic. We are waiting, we are waiting for a new setting in 2023 waiting for the prediction of the final catastrophe. It seems to me that post-pandemic times are excellent times to rethink the mere fragility as also the uncertainty of time. I delved into the concept of time and will present to you some of the ideas I came across that may help us to think time in an untimely way and to look at the practice of waiting and also the powerful practice of letting people wait through the lens of the historical marginalized. The way, describe, the way to describe waiting, the way they endure waiting, tells us a lot about their social positioning. Who can shape and distribute time? Who is allowed and able to feel time as a wealth they can use as they like? being busy, being attentive, being lazy, or just being bored? Who is not allowed to be lazy, to be bored, or to loiter around? And who is described as lazy, bored, and just only loitering? Who are those who are efficient and able to organize their time properly, not losing time, but using time? Time, as we see, is as much connected to space as to affect and also to class. Karl Marx's son-in-law, Paul Lefarge, a Cuban-French socialist, wrote in 1883 his often quoted essay, Le droit à la paresse, The Right to be Lazy. 
He analyzes what he describes as the very strange relationship the working class has to work, to being efficient. The essay starts with the following sentence. Strange delusion possesses the working classes of the nations where capitalist civilization holds its sway. This delusion drags in its train the individual and social vows which for two centuries have tortured sad humanity. This delusion is the love for work, the furious passion for work. Capitalism produces a working class afraid of being out of work, just always trying to be efficient and that way worthy, worthy of life. Lafargue, please, but for the right to laziness, the right to leisure and nothingness, and reminds us that many philosophers of antiquity all over the world actually taught contempt for work and that the poets sang of idleness, calling it a gift from the God. This implies the right to one's own time, like the room of one's own, that Virginia Woolf asked for every, wo every woman and always have to be imagined together with a time of one's own. It is the right to shape time, the right to shape space. Like the figure of the flaneur strolling through the Parisian arcades made famous by Walter Benjamin, who in a footnote talks about this interesting fancy doing of the bourgeois man who would take turtles for a walk in the arcades. Benjamin writes in a footnote to his 1939 essay on Baudelaire, the flaneurs like to have the turtles set the pace for them. If they had it their way, progress would have been obliged to accommodate itself to this space. But this attitude did not prevail. Taylor, who popularized the watchword down the dawdling, carried the day. In Benjamin's interpretation, the flaneur views history in a subversive way. He consciously changes its meanings. The flaneur intervenes into the use of time and tries to slow down modernity, refuses to be fast and efficient, tries to do as the turtles do, go slow. In contrary to that, the working classes cry for work, doesn't want to wait, wants to be like the machine, fast, strong, and efficient. Meanwhile, the flaneur takes his time. The worker is part for the bourgeois plan to conquer the world. The bourgeois is part of the machine. Having said that, Walter Benjamin's flaneur of the Arcade project is presented along with a rack picker wandering through the city. Not only opposing the efficient and clean bourgeoisie, but also a kind of condensed contradiction of capitalism as such. The rack picker is collecting the leftovers of history, meanwhile the flaneur is loitering around, dreaming through the city. It seems to me that it might be sensible, maybe also helpful, to look into different chronopolitics, politics of time, of time making, of time producing, of letting time go. Exploring different temporalities, showing that the way time is perceived is neither static nor universalizable, but depends on the different possibilities to work with and through time and also through space, depending on the subject position. During the pandemic, we can listen in endless radio talks to the privileged classes talking about the gift of time presented by the lockdown that gave them the possibility to read all the books they were not able to read before the pandemic. At the same time, the dispossessed classes were waiting waiting to work to, to start to work, waiting for the trains to bring them home, 
waiting for the schools to restart. The ability to shape the correspondence to the ability to govern oneself and also the other. That is the reason why the Indian historian and physicist Deepesh Chakrabarti writes in Provincializing Europe that the colonized are caught inside a waiting room of history. A waiting room of history where they are doomed to wait and as Franz Fanon observed, even if they move forward slowly, but move forward in the eyes of the colonizers, they were always late. The non-West becomes a waiting room and will, so Chakrabarti, never be quite modern. We recognize waiting and the ableness of shaping time and space as socially marked and defined by those who rule the world. The colonized and the workers were never seen by the Europeans as being able to govern themselves. That's why they had to be taught how to use their time efficiently. That following Chakrabarti calls for another way to look at history, for an alternative historiography. I dream, he writes, of a history that deliberately makes visible through the very structure of its narrative forms its own strategies and practice of repression. This is a history that will attempt the impossible, to look up to its own death by outlining that which resists and escapes the fiercest human attempts to find its translation through cultural and semiotic systems so that the world can, once again, be imagined as radically heterogeneous. Thinking about letting people wait draws us, but also to the affects like shame and rage. Salman Rushdie's third novel, Shame, a post-colonial family saga set in Pakistan, is about the impossibility of decolonization and the close intertwining of shame and violence a dense novel with confusing scenarios. But I am for the moment only interested in the exciting concatenation between shame and violence. The shaming of others is an act of violence. And violence can also be a consequence of shaming. The shamed must find ways to get rid of their shame. There are different ways to be shamed, and certainly shaming can also mean a kind of liberation, namely when it paves a way for the hegemonic subject to free itself from the normality of racist speech. But for the most part, it is not the subject at the center who are shamed, but precisely those at the margins, because they don't know how to behave. They are too loud, they are too tactless, too illogical in their arguments, too inefficient, too restless, because they don't know what is proper, namely letting people finish their talk, feigning interest when there is no real interest, and hanging around with dignity like the flaneur. Shame arises, as Elizabeth Probin points out, in the confluence of bodies, ideas, history, and places. It is precisely the places where bodies come together that otherwise hardly meet and avoid each other on the street. Contact zones, as the post-colonial scholar Mary Louise Pratt calls them. These spaces are brimming with potential shame situations. Rules are constantly broken because they are not known. Misunderstandings are the order of the day. Failure and a practice that does not exclude shame but seeks to deal with it might therefore become the starting point of rethinking our relation to time, to space, and also to work. Letting people wait, wait is a way to use power. The one who waits mostly sits, sometimes on the ground. The one who orders him to be patient stands, waiting, as well as forced idle, is a shaming for those produced as working bodies. 
Think of the prison as a colonial institution to discipline the unruly body waiting to be free again. Shilpa Fatke, Samira Khan and Shilpa Ranade have another take on loitering, on hanging around in the street. In their study, Why Loiter, Women and Risk on Mumbai Streets, they show how the idea of loitering is related to the normativity of civility, of being civil. Following a feminist critique, they show how the so-called public space is always presented as risky for women. When people marked as female enter the space, they are asked why. Why are you here? The authors argue for a right to purpose-free loitering, to purpose-free hanging around in the city. In their opinion, anybody should be allowed in public space to simply walk around without a purpose, without an aim. Benjamin thinks of the flaneur who defies the structuring of what he considers to be his time and space. The public space is used by him like a private space, and hanging around is not seen as something unproductive or problematic in the eyes of the flaneur. But if we turn around and look at migrants, at people of color and other people marked as minorities, we must be able to justify at any time what exactly their goal is, why they dare to be in the public space, just like that. Migrants, people of color and other people marked as minorities are always assumed to be unproductive and destructive. In times of the lockdown, the privileged classes who had previously believed that public spaces belonged to them, were owned by them, interp interpreted the ban to public spaces as an unfair restriction of their personal freedom rights. Talking about the impossibility of bodily movement also means addressing how bodies are intertwined with temporality and speciality. Physical movements have a great influence on how we perceive temporal progressions as well as spatial changes. The lines of motions of our bodies and the intensity of taking space influences our perceptions. From the standpoint of our own immobility, we see things only fragmentarily and become aware of them only from a narrow angle. Masumi confronts us with the uncomfortable fact that the eye can only perceive the movement of our arms and feet as a snapshot. When the head is not moving, a person can only partially observe his own movement. If the head moves synchronously with the rest of the body, the eye can no longer perceive movement, no longer can perceive movement at all. Waiting is mostly associated with restrictions of movement, like sitting in a waiting room. Waiting makes time tangible. You can grab the time. It tucks at our nerves. It makes us irritable. We feel the slow passing of time physically. We feel impatience. We feel anger. We feel longing and desire. We hear our heart palpitate inside our body and maybe a restless boredom. Those who make us wait hope for patience or demand it. Waiting may also be thought together with the politics of location that attempts to attend to the diverse axes of oppression based on race, class, gender, and sexuality to perceive oneself as socially positioned. The location one inhabits might be a waiting room or a parliament, a space from where to rule the masses or a space where to do nothing. According to Hegel, only the male European mind is able to think in the abstract, to imagine the future, 
to think beyond and create art and to imagine to be somebody else in another time, in another space. The idea of the autonomous ruling, of self-ruling subject has been always linked to the subject who is doomed to wait because he seems not able to shape her own space, her own time. The US American essayist Mary Gordon calls waiting the great vocation of the dispossessed. And it is indeed mostly the dispossessed who are put into the situation of waiting, which is different from walking at a slow path. Waiting often is experienced as boredom, but boredom, as Ernst Bloch tells us, is a very powerful space, as it is exactly the same time when people might think of starting a revolution. Here is the double bind, the ambivalence of power. Those making people wait are often not aware that the marginalized might use the time of boredom to find ways to resist. The, the revolution might be the way out of boredom. Today, refugee camps, which are a fundamental part of flight and refugee, are the waiting rooms par excellence. They're often described as non-places. People who try to cross the Mediterranean Sea on rubber boats to save their lives are not only constantly undermining the European border regime, but also the order of the, the, also the order to remain in a waiting room. They disrupt the order of think, the order of time. Different dramas are taking place far away from Europe. The almost one million Rohingyas, for example, who managed to save their lives from the henchmen of the Bumi's military, now live in the misery in Cox bazaars in Bangladesh, waiting, waiting for justice. Violence is the order of the day. Educational opportunities are almost non-existent. Since the military coup, a return to Myanmar is completely out of question. Instead, thousands have been taken to the previously uninhabited island of Bazanchar, which belongs to Bangladesh, where they now live in isolation, a lonely island where the Rohingyas are helplessly exposed to the frequent storms. Rohingyas are doomed to wait on the previously uninhabited island, a situation reminding us of Derrida's ontology, how we have to be able to be hunted by the history. In Spectres of Marx, Derrida refers to an extended temporality, which a purely is, is a purely present, he purely present oriented thinking, which is not able to comprehend adequately. Temporality is understood here in the sense of a fundamental ontology. In his work, Being and Time, Heidegger describes Dasein as being to death and calls this running ahead. Being is determined by ecstasies of temporality. Being in, that means already being in the future itself and before, and present, being with. Temporality is essentially ecstatic. Temporality is originally temporizes itself from the future. Derrida enters into Heidegger's labyrinthic thinking and thus eludes a simplistic notion of time. He speaks of the visitation, the hunting that opens critical spaces in which the non-perishing past calls for persistent memory and encounters the future which questions the present. Past and future thus enter into a critical interrelation. According to Moshe Poston, Derrida's specific concept of memory, and Derrida often says it is contract, the deconstruction is not anything else than memory work, can only be, be understood in the context of the concept of justice. According to this, law and justice are in a productive tension. This justice Derrida calls for is the movement of deconstruction. 
The future, according to Derrida, belongs to the ghosts. In Ken McMullen's 83 film Ghost Dance, Derrida is asked if he believes in ghosts. To this he answers a little bit salmonically, even if this were not the case, he would still say, long may the ghosts live. It is not a matter of believing in ghosts, but of conjuring them up. According to Derrida, the spectral is thereby interwoven with the future, a future that radically breaks, uh, breaks with the here and now and crosses the assumed continuum of history. José Esteban, Esteban Muñoz, for example, looks to the AIDS crisis as a queer intellectual of color. The AIDS crisis becomes the place from where to dream about the future. In the midst of the AIDS crisis, a dystopian time, he finds ways to make a utopian world conceivable. Stop waiting for a better time. Start inviting a utopian future to be ruling the here and now. Describing letting people wait as a tactic of power allows us to see waiting and letting people wait as a question linked to ethics. Interestingly enough, Gayatri Spiva describes ethics as a moment, as an instant. For me, she writes, ethics is the moment that the subject may or may not encounter, and that produces the reflex for which he is trained or not. A moment can decide about good and bad. To train oneself to be able to do the right thing in the right moment, it might be helpful that is maybe to look in a counterintuitive way into history like Chakrabarti dreams of. For that matter, a contrapuntual perspective can be taken. A contrapuntual perspective can only be achieved by a process of unlearning, a complex and persistent activity of undoing oneself, admitting that the idea of identity itself is problematic, and a deep training into listening without falling apart. It's a collective venture. Listen to the multiplicity of narratives in the room. It's not about being good, not about being correct all the time, but about my own view on the world being falsified. It's about responsibility, if we think responsibility as the ability to respond. Contrapunctual perspectives, as I see it, can be drawn of different perspectives. Three are one, Derrida, who talks about destruction of evidence. The other is Luz Irigaray, who says, it's important to try to retell historical experiences in a theater of lost scenes. And Jose Esteban Munoz cry for the disidentification with the nation. Contrapunctual perspectives might enable us to better assess complex, difficult situations, situations where we are doomed to wait. Different experiences with restrictions help us to understand that mobility is a privilege that has always been granted to only a very small group of people. The fact that relatively short-term restrictions make the privilege feel utterly despaired must be compared to the massive violence experienced by people who have never even, even been able to think about more freedom of movement and more time for themselves. Finally, to understand the waiting room of history, we ought to let ourselves be hunted by the ghost of the non-perishing past. At the end of the novel, The Pest, Albert Camus' protag protagonist, Rieu, utters, the plaque was monotonous like abstraction. And when abstraction starts to kill you, then you have to deal with it willy-nilly. And in order to fight against it, you have to resemble it a little bit. 
Waiting has to be learned and unlearned as the desire for work has to be maybe, following Lafargue, exchanged by the desire for just hanging around. I hope to have been able to show that waiting is an ambivalent doing, depending who is waiting and why people have to wait. Thinking about time is an ethical concern. The concept of waiting helps us to see soft tactic of powers, not the brute violence of the gun, but a cunning governing of marginalized by the privileged. take on waiting. Um, we uh, have some time for questions and this is where, okay, great. <laughs> um, just as soon as we have a mic. So I'll hold on to my question. <laughs> Yes, thank you for the commentary and also a very important uh, question. Yes, the doomsday clock was thought for everybody, for, for the world, but of course it has been questioned very often who is meant and who is allowed to set the clock because the clock doesn't run like other clocks on their own, but it is set every 1st of January normally by atomic scientists um, which belong to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in the US. So yes, I think if you um, look at the doomsday clock, you will see that of course we could and we are able to interpret it in very, very different ways, but thought it was for the whole humanity.
waiting can of course be also something that is um, fulfilling or people also describe it also as a spiritual um, a spiritual process also of waiting but the way I was talking about waiting was a very specific waiting a waiting of um, the marginalized classes who are made to wait and who are made also to feel ashamed when they are not efficient and when they are not like always using their body also efficiently and it's a very different uh, idea of the privileged classes where also waiting and uh, also being lazy can be something very fulfilling which is this is something that also in the subject formation of the working classes is just not even able to um, to think and uh, where when it's said that you are just um, uh, loitering or sitting around is something to feel ashamed. On the other hand, the very tactic of make, letting people wait as a form also of, um, of making people feel ashamed of their se self because they are not efficient in this time. So this was the, the, the connection somehow between the effect of shame, the production of shame, and the different spaces um, belonging to classes and how they feel uh, when they talk about time and having time and using time. Uh, which reference were you? Uh, sorry, acoustically, uh, the acoustic is very bad here. What was? Ah, yeah, the lost scenes. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is actually a, a very nice um, concept for Iregare. Um, um, ask that. And of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a feminist perspective that she says if you look, and she looks as a, as a feminist uh, on history and see, sees that a lot of histories in history have not been recounted, that there are scenes in the narratives of uh, telling the stories are like missing. So for her, it's like, um, it's also kind of, um, you know, to, to, to try to work through history, not like recounting again the same narratives, but exactly doing the, the, the contrary, like searching for the scenes that have been lost and to try to, to, to find them, to rescue them, and to somehow put them um, again into the narrative of history. And this is a, a little bit also what um, the um, subaltern studies group, which one of the founder was, Deepish Chakrabarti, also tried, and they called it to, to listen to the small voices of history. And Mil Mal Iregare um, does it in the perspective of a feminist and seeing that, uh, that so many stories of, uh, of women and what they did in history have been lost and we have to somehow recount the stories uh, for the subaltern studies is, of course, the, the subaltern spaces and their narratives and their voices that have been just not inside our um, historiography so that we have to rewrite and dream of other historiographies.
Yeah, I think this is a very important point, and I try to at least, you know, mention it. I didn't go into it, but mention it to the ambivalence of waiting, so that even when the privileged make um, the other, so to say, wait, they don't know what happened during the waiting. And that boredom, as Ernst Bloch tells us, can be always the space for the new revolution to start. And for me, um, waiting is, of course, always um, a space where um, a new form of subjectivity can also arise. In that way, it could be also um, a kind of emancipation or a space of emancipation. But um, it is also very important to focus on the differences, depending on the classes, what waiting means for them in the first place. And then there is always uh, a space and possibility of uh, serendipity. You don't know what happened. Meanwhile, you make people wait. Other questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think if, uh, if there are not any more questions, then uh, we will move on to our next session. And Maria hopefully is here with us for a little bit longer, so we'll have a break soon and we can speak further. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much, Maria. Thank you. Next is another sonic intervention from Tumi Mogorosi and Gabi Motuba. And this one is um, a drum solo mapping the skins and sticks and the force producing a sound and an invocation of life under duress, heartbeat, and blood pumping, searching for life elsewhere.
Uh, it's me again. Uh, we'll take a brief break now, uh, straighten our legs, get a drink, have a smoke, uh, and then we'll uh, gather again for the next session, which is a conversation.
Okay, while well you uh, find your seat and finish your conversations and your dinner, um, I would like to introduce um, our next uh, round of presentation and conversation, which looks at the, let's say, the dichotomies of the presumably linearity of time towards a circular time um, through the aspect of law. And if we want to be a little bit hopeful tonight, maybe also justice. Um, by bringing together two um, aspects of, of law um, that are closely um, entangled and echoing each other from a more um, historical um, overview on colonial crimes and you know, their aftermath and echoes to the practicalities of um, refugee or asylum law and um, yeah, the philosophic, philosophical aspects as well as the very practical political um, aspects behind them. Uh, through these two very broad, of course, topics and some of the um, glimpses into them with us now are Sarah Imani and Daniel Mada, who I will um, introduce to you um, briefly. Uh, Sarah is a qualified lawyer and she studied law at uh, the Sorbonne and uh, Universität in Hamburg. She holds an LLM from New York University and an, AM, uh, sorry, an MA in Peace Studies from Bradford University. Her areas of expertise are international law, international criminal law, human rights law and international legal theory. She worked in these areas as researcher and lecturer for various universities. Besides uh, her work, she researches third world approaches to international law and Islamic international law and legal theory. At ECCHR, she works as a legal advisor in the Institute for Legal Intervention, where she focuses on German and European colonial crimes, as well as critical post-colonial perspectives on law. Daniel, who's also here with us, uh, works as a refugee counselor since uh, 2016. Before that, he has been involved in refugee rights activism in Berlin um, for several years. Currently, he's a member of the Hertefall Commission in Berlin, the Hardship Commission for um, the Refugee Council in Berlin. And uh, we have gotten to know each other and worked together um, recently in the spring of this year because he offered um, to join us for, um, a, for counseling sessions we organized for international students who had to flee um, from the war in Ukraine. And um, a few conversations um, have yeah, started that we hope to continue together. And we're very much looking forward to your presentations. Thank you. So, good evening. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you very much much uh, to um, uh, the conveners of this uh, very wonderful um, event. I'm very honored to be here on the panel together with uh, Daniel. And um, as was introduced already a little bit, um, or as was said during the introduction, um, we start with the historical part of um, time and how time relates to law and then go on to the colonial repercussions, like you've seen already the motive here. Um, in migration law. So, um, yes, I'm here really to t um, talk a little bit about the doctri uh, doctrine of intertemporality in international law. It is a very, it, it sounds so fancy, but it's, it's very much mo one of the most complicated doctrines like <laughs> in international law and uh, really, um, yeah, causes us headaches um, during while, while we're working on colonial crimes and accountabilities for colonial crimes. So I'm here to talk about the intertemporal legality, colonial crimes, and the lay, um, violent awaiting for the return of ancestral re re remains. So normally you would say for a lawyer, okay, time is something very linear, very strict. There is the claim, there is the maybe statue of limitation, that's it. Um, so the logic is very linear. So it seems at first. But then you say, okay, universal human rights, like human rights are universal. Universality is, is but linear. And then, on the other hand, you have the right to have rights, which is completely not. Um, the right to have rights depends on where you are, who you are, um, and when you are claiming those rights. So very particular. So international law 
is really governed by these kind of hegemonic paradoxes of space and time. Space, because, and this is here, I'm working with the third world approaches to international law and critical legal um, um, studies, or critical legal studies, um, in particular focus with, uh, on international law. The world is still divided between the center, the periphery, and the civilized Western legal systems and the non-civilized, non-Western legal cultures, often. They are referred to as cultures. And while the social realities of today um, do not necessarily convene these dichotomies as clear-cut as they did during colonial crimes, and during colonial crimes, the international law, the modern international law as we have it, really originated, took place, um, the same system of racist and capitalist dominance is still in place with the help of international law. And so, time, because through these dichotomies that are still um, in like really in the structures of international law, in the doctrine of international law, um, claiming to be neutral, but in, in fact being completely the opposite, um, the Eurocentric gaze on the world prevails and dominates through time. So while it's clear that international, is not, international law is also a social construction and moves through time, in a way, how it presents itself is very strategic, very neutral, very um, determinate, even though it's completely not. So now the question is, how does, it, how does international law present itself like that? Why? And who benefits? The, the most important question, I think, especially if you work critically. And what are the consequences? And more importantly, when you work on colonial crimes, the colonial repercussions of this sort of um, international law. And this is where the principle of, the so-called principle of intertemporality really comes into play. What does it say? So first of all, it dominates in jurisprudence. It's case law from the 1930s. So very, very old, you already can see the, the narrative here. Um, and it's considered one of the fundamental principles in international law um, to this day. So the doctrine, so to speak, consists of two principles. The first is really to appreciate the judicial fact in the light of the law that is contemporary with it, um, and not the law that, it, that is applied during the time of the dispute. So if you can say, if you think about the Namibian genocide um, and thinking that the Genocide Convention was only um, drafted in 1948 and the genocide uh, of the Overhead River Nama already was committed during uh, 1904, 1908, you can say this is the problem because it didn't exist at that time, so it can't be considered good genocide. Is that, a, is that true? We will see. And then the second principle, and this is often very much neglected in um, the official state discourse on these principles, when the German government, for instance, invokes it, is that um, international law is also constantly evolving and changing. So majority opinion today might soon be overturned by a minority opinion. And um, we still only have to consider what is correct law. So it could be a min minority opinion at that time, but still it's correct law. Um, so we have to keep in mind that, um, uh, to examine that these facts, th these facts um, that, for instance, when you look at the genocide, in terms of their continu continu continued manifestation following the condition required by the evolution of law. So you could say, this is very pragmatic, at that time maybe the genocide as such, as a crime as described in the convention didn't exist, but the principles of humanity as laid out at the Martins Clause sort of covered the same thing. So, um, and it was a sort of emerging norm, a crystallizing norm. But this wouldn't, would not have been considered by the majority, obviously. So what does the, as you see, so now we have the doctrine, what does it do? Obviously, it's, it's part of the rule of law. It gives you certainty, it gives you stability, all of that, what law needs to do. But then, obviously, um, it defends, it argues often in the defense of the status quo and not progressive development. So, and this is, you can see that during the German Namibian um, negotiation, you can see that in the statements by the German government, by other European uh, colonial powers as well, former colonial powers, or, um, so to speak. So, from a trilingual perspective, we really have an apologetic 
international law uh, that still, uh, still uh, follows the same oppressive, uh, oppressive and exclusive logic of that uh, very much uh, like this very particular colonial international law. So who benefits, obviously, the former colonializer, and so what we have is a perpetuation of exclusion. So post what we have also is past wrongs go unaddressed and shield the colonial um, powers from accepting legal, respons legal responsibility, not moral, not ethical, legal responsibility um, in the past and in the present. So, and I, rem I know that uh, there, here was, there, was an, um, there was an event here also, uh, like a conference on reparation as well. And this, these two um, topics really much um, intertwine because, because of the effects of the principle of intertemporality, saying that genocide didn't exist as a crime, as a legal um, statute, like a statute or a convention. Um, it wasn't a crime, hence there are, so we don't have a legal basis for reparation. And reparations are always um, a legal consequence, um, a legal consequence of a crime, a wrongful act. So basically, as I said, the legal reasoning goes as follows. The, the, the international law, even the protective laws that were at, uh, applied at that time, didn't apply to the non-civilized. Um, so we don't, and also we didn't have anything like the Genocide Convention. Um, at the moment, these crimes were, colonial crimes were committed, hence we do not have a crime, hence no legal basis for reparation nor restitution. Voila, done. So this is what the application of the doctrine of intertemporal law does. Um, and what it does really is that we have factual occurrence of colonial crimes um, that do not apply to, like, and we have protective law, laws that do not, not apply to the colonized subject. Here we have the spatial dimension. They aren't under the, the, the space, the protective space of international law. But even those law, laws that might be inclusive to the formerly colonized do not apply neither. So meanwhile, what we have is a continuous um, actual harm ongoing through generational trauma and exclusion. And because of colonial injustices and the lack of a comprehensive and respectful distress. As I said, I already cited the Namibian example. Um, after years of years of negotiation, Namib like Germany at least admitted, yes, it was genocide, but it, again, only from today's perspective. This is the wording. So, and this is intertemporal, <laughs> like the doctrine of intertemporal law really uh, uh, in play. Um, what we, but I think what also is a very, very hurtful and very like, strong example of these colonial repercussions and the, the, the um, non-acknowledgement of the legal dimension of these colonial harms um, because of the doctrine of intertemporal law is the, how the, the former colonial powers um, handle uh, human remains, human remains in um, quotation marks. So they are still lying in these archives of German collections, um, many of those from the, not exclusively, but from the so-called colonial context, forgotten and uncared for. So again, what this example is, illustrates, even though they were taken during colonial times, but they're still here in the present, and um, it shows how colonial harm and wrongdoing is perpetu perpetuated through time on the colonial subject, the black brown body, through generations and waiting for their ancestors to return to their families and communities. Colonial crimes, and this is what I really want to stress here, are ongoing infinite crimes, despite the finite argumentation behind the doctrine, uh, doctrine of intertemporal law. And we. So what we, are, we are still left in a situation where this factual situation, factua sorry, factual situation where we have a waiting of the deceased, the people, the humans in the archives, waiting for themselves to return to their communities. They were once taken from against their will, but also the descendants waiting for the return of their ancestors. And this means violence and dehumanization, violence through dehumanization of those people in the archives and their descendants. 
one of the human remains themselves. They are dehumanized through the archive. But also, and this is what we at ECCHR really want to like, work on, they have constitutional rights under the German constitution and human rights under various uh, international human rights pacts or conventions. But denying them those rights because they are still considered as objects, basically, uh, is a violence and a violence through waiting. And also we have the violence and dehumanization for the descendants themselves because they are suffering. They are suffering um, very real psychological and spiritual harm. Um, whenever I talk with people searching for their ancestors in the archives, this is what they describe. And the post-colonial state exercises powers, and I think this is also where this really uh, much relates. Um, and give me a hint if I'm over drawing time. So um, exercise is powers by letting these people wait. Um, so this is, it, the descendants are left to back. They are saying, OK, there is no legal claim. If, if we are doing this, this is out of courtesy or committee. Um, and this means the post-colonial state still remains all the authority and agency by those uh, who really have the rights and rights, I mean, constitutional rights are there to shield, to, to protect you from the states, um, are not even acknowledged as rights holder, right holders. So, and also, this is what I also want to, also want to stress, is the descendants themselves also have constitutional and human rights. They have the right to mourn, to bury their ancestors. And they're, again, through this waiting, are denied those rights. So what would the state say? Again, um, the very static uh, conception of the law. There are statutes of limitation. You might have the right. This is one thing. But to have the right to have rights has its, because of time limits, has its limits. So you, you might have the right, but you'd, it's, it's over. It's, it's too long ago. Um, so what we have then is a disconnect and I've heard the word justice, which I shrinking, I'm shrinking away all the time as a lawyer, but like really <laughs> this, um, there's a huge disconnect between procedural material justice, yes, there is this rights, And sometimes even directors and museums, they, they come to agree that yes, there might be some constitutional rights at play. Um, and the procedural justice, I can't go to, to a court to claim those rights, to enforce those rights. And there is an end. Yes, there are the rights, they are somewhere in the space and time, but here is the end, finit, fin, finis, so to speak. But still what is ongoing is the harm and the ongoing, viol not only the harm, but the ongoing violation of human and constitutional rights as a repeating hurt and harm of those humans in the archives and their descendants. So what can we do um, if we don't want to give up? Um, here are some preliminary, preliminary think bits, and this is what I want to conclude with. Um, so I think we need to understand, in order to tackle this doctrine of intertemporal law uh, that gives so much power to the post-colonial state, we need to argue that the correct law has a spectrum. Interpretation and argumentation is part of the law, so you can change the law even if you even if you keep, so to speak, the, 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 the main uh, body of it, but you can change it through argumentation and inter interpretation. And this is what actually the second principle that often is like left under the table um, of the doctrine itself says as well. There is an evolution of international that needs to be kept, uh, that needs to be, uh, be considered. Also, and this is a very specific to human rights law, um, historic interpretation, meaning what the uh, legislator wanted the, the norm to do, has, is a subsidiary means of inter method of interpretation, which is interesting because it gives you much, much more room for ev uh, evaluative um, interpretation. And, and this is not nothing I argue, this is something that is in doctrine and legal uh, like in uh, the academia. Obviously, there, there, there are norms transcending time. Um, these are used Kogans, and genocide, for instance, is considered one of those. 
like preemptory, very high, on the highest es echelon of the norm hierarchy sort of norms. What I want to conclude with um, is with a trial and, again, a trial and you know, a third world approach uh, international, to international law perspective. There's a suggestion by a scholar called Mumbiala uh, to replace the doctrine of intertemporal law with the doctrine of transtemporal law in cases of historic and colonial injustices. Because as I'm de describing, there's a disconnect with the ongoing and the finite. So um, Mumbiala here argues that since the fact at the origin of the uh, commitment of the colonial crimes still has, have, uh, or has uh, effect today, continue to do actual factual harm, state responsibility still applies legal responsibility. And here what I would add is that we should apply that new doc doctrine of uh, transtemporal law to the gravest of the gravest crimes, like genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, because there we are really much in line of what is considered positive international law. And uh, so I think that would make makes much more argumentative sense. But again, this is law, it's debatable, and time will prove me right, wrong, or just another opinion on what law, the law is. On that note, thank you, and I give hand over to my colleague. This should work now. Thank you very much for the invitation and um, thank you very much also for the first presentation. Um, we didn't plan this, so we're gonna see how this um, ends up um, and we are hoping to get into a um, discussion also with you guys. Um, Also, I'm, I'm very grateful because when I was asked to, um, to, to share some thoughts here, um, lots on, on, the, on the question of waiting, lots of questions came up into my mind and uh, gave me the chance to reflect um, the work that I do um, with regard to the question of waiting and uh, what does waiting mean for the people who are in the realm of uh, migration policy. And, and I think what you made clear is that it has a linear, it's, it's a linear thing, it's, it's a historical um, aspect that waiting, um, and it's a question like who has to wait? Um, it's always the subject or the perceived subject that has to wait um, for the reason that the subject that has to wait is not um, perceived as an agent. Um, but ra just rather as a subject that um, that the state can um, decide upon, and I think this is also the link to um, to to what we see in migration policy today, is that the situation is still the same. We do have subjects, and um, we don't see them as agents. And um, today I want to talk about other possibilities to to come back to agency. First of all, I think it's important to mention that um, if I talk about waiting and what waiting constitutes for people, it's that I'm not affected by it. I have a German passport um, and uh, I'm not affected by the migration policy at all. I'm only affected um, through the way that I am um, trying to um, assist people of getting a residence permit, but um, I myself are in a rather privileged position. So I guess anyone who doesn't have a German citizenship or European citizenship, for, uh, for those it's totally different, because you're often in this um, situation of waiting. 
And for example, if you um, are here on a student's visa or, or not any other kind of visa, it's always that you have to wait because your residence is gonna end at some point and you have to wait and you never know, is it going to be extended or not? And this is what I would say, always a state of uncertainty. And this state of uncertainty, um, this waiting um, has effects for each and every one. Um, psychologically, but also physically. So as I said, I do see waiting as a space of uncertainty where you don't know where you stand and where you are going. And it's, it's a kind of violent state um, that you're in. In this realm of waiting, I would say you're in the, you're subjugated to, the, to state power and state authority. Because you can't decide. Someone is deciding for you. Um, and I would say that there are two kinds of waiting. There's the, the rather passive waiting, or what you might call bare waiting and active waiting. I think that's a, a major difference that we have to make. Um, if you have been talking about um, the ancestors who are waiting for the human remains to be brought back to their homeland, um, for most of them it has been a rather passive um, waiting. Um, only once they get active and once they um, raise their voice, um, the waiting becomes something um, productive and people got agency, right? Um, and I think we always have to think how, how is it possible and what kinds of path can we take to, to get to this active waiting? Because whatever you do, you are subjugated um, to this waiting, but um, I think there are always pathways to this active waiting. However, they might be very small and often they're very tiny and just fractures. Um, but I think they're always there. Um, sometimes they're hidden and we have to find it. It always also reminded me what when you said when you talked about the human remains, um, just um, what was it a year ago that the Berlin um, Palace um, was was opened with all the artwork um, that was gathered all over the world, um, and it's also this kind of power that um, the state um, holds over over people, over objects over history um, and over narratives, um, yeah. And if I say that waiting has these two forms, this active and passive form, um, maybe I just give you two examples um, from, from the work that I do. I do work with, um, a lot, I've been working lots with refugees from Eritrea. Um, Eritreans um, have, lots of Eritreans have fled Eritrea due to the harsh treatment in the military service. Um, Eritrea is um, often referred to as the North Korea Africas and for good reasons. So, when I talk about names, obviously I, I did change the name. I, let me just um, just quickly let you um, know about the story of Awet, who left Eritrea and who left his family behind. Um, he did make it um, to Europe, but it took a long time and he was waiting. First he, he went to Sudan. He was waiting, hopefully, um, to, to, to reach uh, a solution to his situation. He did find out that there was no solution there, so he continued to Europe. He crossed the Mediterranean Sea. Um, also there, the uncertainty, um, does he make it? Because so many people die. Then he arrived uh, in Europe. He was recognized as a re refugee in Germany. 
Luckily, he didn't have to wait that long um, for the decision to be made to be recognized as a refugee, but so many do. And particularly in the years 2015, when so many people came, um, the whole procedure, the whole asylum procedure took um, one to two years. And in this time, you're waiting. You're waiting, 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 and you're, you're barely waiting. There's nothing you can do. So once he was recognized as a refugee, he had the right to bring his family. His family had to flee uh, Eritrea as well. He had, the, the family had to apply for um, family reunification uh, in Ethiopia. And they had to be put on a, they had to register um, for a waiting list, on a waiting list at the M German embassy. It took them, um, what was it, 11 months um, just to get the appointment. Today, it takes someone who is willing to reunite with their family members in Germany more than 24 months of waiting just to get the uh, appointment at the embassy. From there, it takes you another year or sometimes two years to get the decision. And why is that? Obviously, the embassy does have limited resources, but it's also the state power that decides on where do we allocate the resources at. Because if you would um, apply for family reunification um, to German citizen, or if you would apply for a visa for um, working purposes, it would take you a fraction of time, a fraction. You might even be lucky and get um, an appointment within a month, right? So there's the question, who do we give the power to and how, like, who has to wait and who doesn't have to wait? And it's not, the, not, not white people, not um, privileged people with um, educational background where we think um, they can be a, a plus for our economy. So we, did, do we do differentiate uh, between people who do have to wait and people who don't have to wait or who don't have to wait as long. But I think there's also a positive aspect about waiting. And waiting can also be used as a form of resistance. If we um, take, for example, Mamadou, he's from Guinea, and Germany considers him usually, especially um, men from Guinea, not to be recognized as um, refugees. Because there's the assumption, whatever you went through, it's very easy for you to go back. You'll manage, you'll survive. How you survive doesn't matter, but you'll survive. And he did use the asylum procedure, and he knew that his chances aren't too good, right? So he, 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 he knew this, and he chooses um, to um, try to um, parallelly go for um, a different, a, a second option. He tried to integrate as best as he could. He did learn the language um, very, very quickly. He did um, finish uh, a high school. Um, he got a certificate and he um, started uh, vocational training. Only, he, this was only possible because he used the time of waiting to do something productive. And therefore, as you see, I think it's often uh, a question of perspective. And it's, I think, often, in particularly in my, my task as a, as a refugee counselor, um, to open up these new perspectives so that people um, can see what they can do in this time of waiting. Often also I see that if you do explain people the situation that they are in, the, the laws that apply to them, the rights that they have, this changes already a lot. Because they, 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 they change from bare waiting to active waiting because they know what's happening. 
and only then you you do get a chance to to be active and and, and to be an agent uh, in its own right and it's it i think it's on the one hand it's, i think it's devastating to see you know that um, there is this colonial legacy and um, that um, we we tend to still be in that um, place where, where people have to wait and um, people aren't um, agents. But I think there's also um, hope for change um, and for resistance. Um, just when Ukraine, uh, when Russia in, in invaded Ukraine uh, and so many people um, came to Germany, and particularly students, it was um, Savi who said, we need to do something. Because they have been thinking out of the box and I'm really grateful um, for you to, to have opened this space um, for people who left the war um, in order um, to find an info point where people can gather, change, exchange ideas. And I think there you, you did create, in particular, such a space where you did give back people agency. And I think that's um, a great thing and that's, yeah what we have to go for. Thanks. <laughs> Any thoughts <laughs> or you guys? Yes, there's. Um, so, um, the, the principle of trans uh, temporal temporality is very much in theory. Um, it's, it's, it's quite new. It's, it's, it's all the work, like legal work on colonialism, is quite new, actually. Um, so, that is theory, but um, what especially we at the European Center for Constitution and Human Rights are, are doing, we're trying to move this sort of decolonial theory into decolonial praxis legal praxis, and as I said, um, I think um, legal argumentation and um, interpretation, um, decolonial interpretation of positive racist norms um, is possible. Some would refute that and say, oh, the, all, all law is power, and law can never be applied, but I um, very much disagree. And um, to give an example how that could look like, like <laughs> And this also relates um, to agency, as we're saying, okay, this is, again, restitution is not a, like a, or reparation restitution is not about morality, your morality or something, it's about their rights. And um, when we talk about the rights of the deceased, um, sorry, the, the right of the descendants of the deceased, of those human remains in the archives, um, in order for them to claim the rights, so this gets a little bit technical, there needs to be a sort of um, closeness in relationship. Like, so, at, so there is jurisprudence case law again and saying, okay, this is um, only like the grandchild, for instance, or, and only the direct grandchild. But what you could do is say, oh wait, but like in Tanzania, this is a case we're working on, like the idea about family, community is much broader. You have to understand that, you have to integrate that. Um, and then by doing that and by bringing these arguments, you could widen um, the, yeah, the, hopefully if we, if we are successful, the case law on it, and then the understanding of family um, very much beyond um, what is the typical heteronormative, Eurocentric way of understanding family, for instance, that would be one. And um, in terms of racism, um, all of this is racism. Um, and it's racism through ingrained, really ingrained in the, 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 the DNA of international law. Um, and 
So, if, so there is a convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination, that's the United Nations like International Convention, um, and obviously claiming these rights at, for, like, I'm working on colonial crime, so obviously there's police rights and all these very, very, very important issues, but in order to say, okay, this is racism, this is quite new, and this is, uh, this is, and this is racism not in the past, that it's not about history lesson, it's very much about, about like the same, black life matters even after the internet, and you're not respecting that, and they have rights. And this is um, how we kind of trying to address this racist dimension, um, even in legal, pre like if, if we are successful in the long term, um, to, to move that into really like litigation, <coughs> that would be then in practice and not only in theory, if that answers your question. question. Yeah, sure. As you're describing the, the development of this argumentation, are you seeing this to, like, the, the, the agency largely within the legal community, or to what extent is, are, you know, people like the folks who are just in the audience today, or the refugee counselors as part of presenting these new types of arguments in either the court or just in the uh, public opinion sphere? Mm -hmm. um, again, I can only answer, this is, so, the way we at ECCHR do, do it, like, Law cannot be and be with, without activists. We need activists. We need advocacy. We need art. We need like you, you need to contextualize. Otherwise, the, the the law still remains the tool of the powerful. Um, so it's not only a legal intervention, so to speak. But we what we do we we doing when we're doing strategic legal, legal intervention, we're framing it with whatever. Like, for instance, our work on human remains, we did a podcast. It's, it's like, it's simple, but it's nice that we talk, we talked with Mboro, he was here as an activist, like, a, he's fighting, like, talking about agency and, like, time. He's fighting for over 10, like, 30 years, although he's in the guy who's in, in searching the, the head of Mangameli. There was a very prominent article in, uh, in Spiegel online. And he doesn't give up. And obviously, so when we work with him and we, we, we try to give him as much voices as he needs, and obviously, again, using the law to his benefit and putting the law into his service. This is what we do, yeah. But I think what is also very interesting is that, I mean, it's also a question like who made the law, right? I mean, we are talking about what laws do apply um, and that we can apply to bring back the human remains. Um, but it's also a question like who made the law? What, what, what are we talking about, the rule of law? Um, who participated in making the law? Um, and it's, it's in particularly uh, like the, the, the idea of of the legal system as we have it today is a very, very uh, Eurocentric one. Um, the, and, and, and therefore shaped by racism, right? Um, also possession, I mean, like who possesses something? Um, it goes back to um, slavery. And I mean, back then slavery was right, you know? Like you, if you possessed slaves, that was a legal act. And therefore, it's all also, all of, of also the question like, like, what rights are we talking about? And who put the, the rights into place? And who, who serves these rights? And they, I think also rights have a limit, right? I mean, we are always trying to, 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 to use rights in, in certain ways to, to gain something, but it also does have a limit, I guess. And it plays also a little bit in this, what I was saying, like there is a material justice and a procedural justice. And again, time, like these sort of um, litigation before, like, they could take up to 10, 20, like if you want to go to the constitutional court, it takes you ages. And this is something an individual who was harmed then also needs to bear to be um, to be as powerful and like have the energy to, to go through that. And uh, yeah, I think this is also the very problematic, um, yeah, temporal dimension of procedural law. Uh, 
Um, hello, thank you for the conversation. Um, I have two questions for uh, both of you. Uh, because you talked about reparation movements and uh, it just reminded me of a very uh, interesting interview between Sadia Hartman and Frank Wilderson III. It's called The Position of the Unthought, where Sadia Hartman said, like had uh, made a critique on reparation movements from the 90s in the US, where she describes it as a move that reinscribes the power of making just back to the state, to the system, where it clearly cannot. And yeah, I, I think it's just a very interesting point. Maybe you can make a comment on that, but which also links back to um, your thought on law and its possibility of making just or justice. And the second question is on uh, this difference between passive waiting and active waiting uh, and this ambivalent line uh, that emerges uh, in the notion of agency. Um, I didn't really, I wasn't really clear on that. Um, in a way, like I think agency relies very much on the precondition of uh, institutional framework that allows that agency to, to emerge. Like it, it clearly has like this kind of systematic limitations to it. So maybe could you further explain on that a little bit? Thank you. Um, yeah, so in terms of preparation, um, um, I'm not a little bit familiar with that critique. Um, I think there there's so much to say about reparation, uh, reparation as a movement, reparation as a legal term, um, which for me need to interact, but normally necessarily don't. They don't need to. Um, reparations needs to need to be understood really um, much broader than just payments. This is all also a very like usual um, um, misconception of reparations. And because, and here was this Derrida, uh, uh, memory is sort of deconstruction. So I think this goes to the heart of it because reparation is also memory. It's also like, it could be a reparation method to um, have access to memorial sites or to have um, apology, if you like. Like, apology is problematic. This goes a little bit to, I think, to the Hartman, Hartman uh, comment as well. But um, I think there, it's, it's, it, it could be considered as a co toolbox, and then you could give back to those who are, like, to whom the reparations are due to decide what reparations look like for them. And another very prominent example are the CARICOM, like for the Caribbean states, they really, as a movement, as a like, legal, they, they have a 10 point plan, which really much reflects this past, present, future continuum, um, to use chimneys, another Trilian scholar's term, um, of colonial harm and colonial repercussions. So. Um, I think there are many ways um, and positive like ways to 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 walk and um, to approach reparations. Yeah, let me try to um, share some more thoughts on the difference between active and passive waiting. I think you're right if you say the the line between them are is is is. You can't. It's not. It's not clear cut, and um, you you might change from the one state to the other state. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll give you. I'll give an example. Um, if if you do, if you are in the process of of a family reunification and you do wait for um, for the decision by the um, by the um, by the embassy, um, often there's nothing. There, there might be a, a, sp a time where that you, there's nothing that you can do. You're just waiting there. You are sitting there. You're going every day to work. You're looking into your mail. N no email arrived. And this is like 
this, this, um, this is a loop every day, this is happening. Um, but sometimes um, there is something that you can do. For example, you can gather um, new documents that prove your point. Um, maybe you find uh, statements by relatives, um, and therefore you do become active. And I, I do think that psychologically this changes quite a lot in people's minds. Um, because if you do think that you are that there's something that you can do, there is the, there's also the hope that that something can change and that you have that you do have a say in this procedure, in this process. Whether you have or not, that's uh, that's a different question. But um, I think psychologically, it it makes a, a huge difference because I know so many people who do break. I know many families who broke up. I um, know um, several people um, who did commit suicide because they, didn't, they, they couldn't take it anymore. Um, the waiting was just too much for them, right? Um, and, the, um, and I know several, um, I know uh, a daughter who isn't talking to, um, to her um, father because she believes that her father doesn't want um, um, her to come to Germany. Because why is it taking so long? She doesn't understand it, right? Um, because she's waiting and waiting, and, and she, she, there's nothing she can do, right? Um, and this is um, very harmful to people, I think. Um, yeah. And. The question of agency is a very tricky one. Like, when, when are you an agent and when aren't you? Um, I believe that the idea of the state um, is that, you, that people shouldn't be agents. Um, because this makes it more difficult for, for, for the state, right? If you do stress, if you always, like, if you ask them questions, if you um, go to speak to, you speak to politicians, you know, this is like, this is what they don't want. They just want to do their work. Um, so therefore, I think the, the, the whole idea in the, in the realm of migration policy is that the idea is that they don't want agents um, to deal with. They just want to deal with numbers and, um, and subjects, right? I don't know if, if that um, um, touched the point you made. Um, I might just not see, I hear voices, but I don't see anyone moving, okay. That's fine. For you, so we can wrap up. Any, any thoughts you wanted to end with or? I think as a concluding remark, I think the way how migration policy is designed, is designed today is is a clear example of those colonial repercussions and how those people, um, as a first of all, they shouldn't be agents, they are not even right holders, they, they shouldn't come into the civilized, they should remain at the periphery. All of that is very, like migration, the, the field of migration law is one of the, like the battlefields of, um, yeah, to address colonialism, colonial legacy. Um, and the racist dimension, like the really strong racist dimension in international law, and it really plays out in this. Um, so I think his work is so, so, so important um, because this is where it, it's still happening. Um, and working on colonial crimes, I uh, think it's, it's a strategic choice. I mean, you could say, okay, let's put all our funds, all our energy into migration work because this is happening now. But I think for colonial crimes, it, it, it's about making this, like bringing, it, bringing this to the fore, really, um, how the past, present, future, and the future in terms of what sort of humanity we want to have to restore our all humanity for the future um, 
this is how they interconnect and this is what we need to decide. Okay, thank you. Yeah, also, did you, yeah, um, thank you so much for this and not wanting to uh, harmonize anything you said, but maybe to me, one thing um, I take again as a reminder is also what you said, Zara, just now. Yes, it is a field of high expertise, but we shouldn't leave it to the experts. And that overlapping of other parts of society and living um, um, and pushing and resisting against certain is also should or could be part of other people of other experts' works, and that's um, you know through a wide field, be it arts, be it media, um, you know that connection of to then come to something that might um, resemble justice <laughs> um, is the work of many experts in a wider sense, maybe. So that's something. I think that will ring with me for, for a longer time as well. Thank you so much both for um, sharing out of your practice and connecting it to also many other practices that are there. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah and Daniel. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's so important to also normalize the legal terminology as well and for us to understand how these structures work and how they are complicit and what we can do to push them. Um, now we are going to take a 10 minute break before we move on to our last set, uh, which is a uh, last session, which is a DJ set. So. Get ready <laughs> for that. Yeah. <laughs>
on with the last intervention from the day. Uh, the last intervention will be done by Manuela. Uh, Manuela Garcia Aldana is a Colombian interdisciplinary artist based in Berlin. In her process-based work, which constitutes of soundscapes, DJ sets, collective listening practices, radio shows, and drawings, listening is the principle and arises as a context-driven response to the search for spaces of encounter. She addresses the diaspora and identity questions with the will to unlearn and remember other ways of inhabiting a collective life experience. Manuela has a Master of Arts from uh, the Universitat de Los Andes in Bogota and currently studies in the master's program at the Berlin Kunsthochschule Weissensee in Spatial Strategies. Uh, some of her latest works and compositions have been featured at the Kunsthaus Dahlem, Brücke Museum, NGBK, uh, Neue Gesellschaft für Bilder de Kunst, and Eran Sound and um, many others, and it's having contemporary too. <laughs> um, you can find her, Sony, um, find her in the Sonic Waves monthly on the internet radio Alaha Palestine. And today she's going to be uh, inviting the ancestors uh, and open a sonic space for joy and liberation. Popular music on vinyl from the global south and elsewhere, soundscapes will guide us on a collective sonic ritual. Please welcome Manuela.
this plan to listen carefully, they will change.
película cantando por los peleles quisiera reírme pero no puedo letra letra y esa es la canción Hello. esa es la canción Hello. Oh, 
Cuando hiciste el quemado que yo te ayudé a sembrar el arroz Tambor, 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 tambor Tanto como yo te ayudé y me quieres negar lo que nació hey, hey, Yo soy la mujer de mala Tan bonito este pelado blanco y lo dejo que yo tenía que tú me lo negara.
donde está y orquestra me llama quite canto bolero canto guagongo canto biguín canto mazuca y bomba bam bam yo sé que bam 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 yo sé que bam 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 bam
Oh, so 